I was safer around women, and I liked to be around girls, and all of my friends were girls. I wanted to be a girl, and I wanted to just uh, be with men. I thought that I was gay. When they addressed it, they actually affirmed me in it, and they encouraged me to embrace the homosexual lifestyle. When I started to see that the people in front of me that were loving me actually had a real relationship with the Lord, that's when I realized this, this was real. God was real. Welcome to Pure Passion. My name is Jonathan Darty, and I'm your host for today's program. If you listen to the voice of the media today, it's very likely that you believe that homosexuals are born that way and that they cannot change. You've been told that free sexual expression is harmless and that if someone chooses to be a drag queen or a prostitute, that it's their choice and that it's unloving and hateful for anyone to question the wisdom of that choice. Today's guest was all of those things and he has something to tell you. My name's Daniel and I grew up with my mom and my dad was in the picture until I was about a year and a half. He was very physically abusive to her, so she immediately got out of the um, relationship. And um, so I grew up without a father until I was about four. I had a stepfather that came into the picture. That he was a very um, abusive man as well, and he was an alcoholic. So. I didn't feel very safe with him as I grew um, probably from the ages of six to 11. I would go and visit my father, my biological father on the weekends. And um, when I was around him, he, and, um, he would uh, abuse us a lot just with uh, physical abuse and sometimes emotional abuse. And he would use a lot of fear and different things. And so I always, I was always afraid of him, and uh, and I didn't trust men at an at an early age, and uh, so I I think the earliest that I remember I was four years old, and I was safer around women, and I liked to be around girls, and all of my friends were girls, and I had an older brother who was the exact opposite of. Of, of me, I was more on the feminine side, my brother was more on the masculine side. But um, I grew up with just tremendous amount of gender uh, confusion. I was confused about gender. I wanted to be more like a girl and I didn't like being a boy. And so, um, and so I didn't have a lot of support. I didn't have anyone there calling me out or helping me navigate this world of being male. And so, uh, and so I started being more on the feminine side and that progressed as I grew older. I wanted to be more like a girl and you can imagine what that was like in school. I was teased tremendously in school by my peers. I was rejected. I was made fun of. And for me, I, the way that I coped was that I ignored it and I denied any sort of feeling or any sort of reality, anything that I was that was going on in my life, uh, wasn't happening. And uh, when I was about ten years old, my mother, my mother became mentally ill, and she she had nervous breakdowns uh, several times from the age ten till I was eighteen, and then even further on from there, and. Uh, and so it was a very traumatic experience for me. And so I created another world to help me to cope with the fact that my mom had mental illness. And so, and so I lived in my head a lot and I wanted to be a girl and I wanted to just uh, be with men. I thought that I was gay, but I never said anything to anyone because I was so afraid that I was gonna be in trouble. 
And so um, by the age of 14, I started seeking counseling. And um, I had been in counseling before, but counselors had never addressed the gender confusion. They had never addressed the same sex attraction that I was experiencing. And finally, when they, when they addressed it, they actually affirmed me in it and they encouraged me to embrace the homosexual lifestyle. So they referred me to a teen coalition of homosexual group and I went to it and I embraced the homosexual lifestyle when I was probably in my second semester of my freshman year in high school. And so going on from there from in high school, I was openly gay and um, teased, but not so much simply because I was out and there was really nothing for me to hide. And so I spent the rest of the time acting as though, you know, I was outspoken and I wasn't afraid of anyone when in reality I was scared. <laughs> I was scared out of my mind actually. And, um, and I thought there was no hope out of this life. And I thought, well, I might as well just embrace it, you know? And I always thought that I was in trouble growing up. I always thought I was the reason why things happened, the reason why my mom got sick, the reason why my dad left, the reason why I was sexually abused. I always thought it was my fault and that I was going to be in trouble. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to be in trouble, skip it. I'm just going to do whatever I want and forget about everybody else. And I'm just going to live life, you know, and let it happen. My sexual abuse started when I was, I would say, five years old, five or six. And it started from um, family members. And I never really said anything about it, but it started at a very young age. And then it started happening with peers that were older than me. And it started to, to happen and, and I didn't know what to do. I thought it was normal. And, uh, and I didn't know what to say because I didn't want, again, to be in trouble because I thought that I was the reason why this was happening. I was just so devastated and I grew up wanting to act like that never happened the encounters that I would have with boys, you know, as a young, as a young boy, I wanted to act like it never happened. And, um, cause it was so shameful and I didn't, I didn't really want that. And I didn't really want the same sex feelings as well. It was just shameful because I didn't, I didn't like the way I, f I felt, you know, I felt so dirty and used. If you are a sexually broken person, someone who loves one, or a leader in search of helpful resources, Pure Passion, the TV show, is only the beginning of how we can help. Our primary ministry website is purepassion.us, where you can find over 180 videos, all arranged by topic for easy access. We also have audio files of entire conferences featuring some of the finest teachers in the field of sexual brokenness. Read countless articles on a myriad of topics related to sexual sin and brokenness. Watch a video of the story behind our ministry, including the dramatic life of our founder, David Kyle Foster. Visit our online store for the latest in books, DVDs, and CDs on the topic of sexual brokenness. Read our monthly newsletter or visit other ministry links that are familiar to us. We also have links to our Facebook and Twitter pages as well as links to our free Android and iPhone phone apps, hundreds of videos, audio files, articles, and more, a wealth of resources at your fingertips, and all free of charge. Just go to purepassion.us. In my teen years, um, I thought that I could consent to different things, that I could consent to sexual activity. And so I started going out. And I lived in Texas and it was a, I lived in South Texas near the border of Mexico. And the thing to do was to go to Mexico and to drink and to go to the bars. And there was a lot of underage drinking going on. And even in the town I lived in, there was a gay bar that I was introduced to at the age of 15. And I was allowed to go into that bar but they knew that I was an 18 because I didn't look like an adult. I mean, I still looked like a teenager. And they knew that, 
I mean, the, the owners of, of the bar knew it. And, but they would let underaged teens in, whether male or female, because it helped their clientele. Now, I didn't know that growing up until later, until actually I got saved and I realized, oh my gosh, I was abused, you know? Because a lot of the men that I was with, they were, they were older, they were already adults, and I was still 15, 16, 17 years old. Then at the age of 17 and a half, I started be dressing up as a drag queen and wanting to be a woman. And because I, I grew up watching these cross dressers and I thought, well, this is my, I, I'm gonna live this fantasy of wanting to be a girl. And so I did. I, I actually grew up watching the cross dressers or the drag queens when I would go to the bars and I, they would perform and I would watch them perform and I would, I would see them and I would think, wow, I, I want to be that. So I started, I started to pursue it. And by the age of 18, I started to compete in pageants. And by the age of 19, I started to um, compete in professional pageantry. And I actually went all the way to a professional pageant in Texas for, for, for drag queens. It was actually called the Miss Gay Texas Pageant. And so I went and I, I performed there. And, um, but I remember sitting there and thinking to myself, why am I here? What is this life about? There's actually, there, there's actually all of this and there's no joy. There's no, there's no joy in my life. There's no answers to the questions I'm asking. And I don't know who I am. And so I started to go on a journey of trying to find out, Lord, if you don't want me to be doing this, then I need you to show me what you want me to be doing. I remember going to the youth group when I was a freshman in high school. And then I was dealing with addiction, drug addiction. I was dealing with even suicidal ideation and even trying to commit suicide. And I remember being 16 years old and there was a neighbor who was a believer. And she one day said that the Lord put it on her heart to go and get me, that he pretty much spoke to her and said, go and get him, go across the street, knock on his door and go and invite him to church. And she had an argument with the Lord and was like, do, we, do you know who we're talking about here? <laughs> You know, do you know who we're talking about here? No. And she was like arguing with the Lord until she acquiesced and she came across the street. I walked in and everybody was scared. All the teens just split the room and rightly so, because I came in with a poncho, a rainbow poncho and big, you know, platform shoes and <laughs> bell bottoms. I mean, it was just ridiculous, you know, and but I I didn't have anything else to give them but just what I was going through and the person I was at that point. And so I just remember sitting there and listening about Jesus and what he was like. And I remember the woman who was preaching, she was the preacher for the, um, for the youth group. She would just preach a storm, you know, like, and she would just preach about the love of God and how God wanted to come and deliver people out of, out of the things that they were going through. And she would pray for me. She would have me come up. And I remember one time she had the men pray for me and I would just let them pray for me because I didn't know what else to do. I always wanted for the men in my life or men in general to accept me. And when they did just to love me and to pray for me, <laughs> you know, that the Lord would just show me, talk to me, speak to me, whatever. I was happy with that, you know, because it was some sort of connection with the male gender, you know, and, and to me it meant so much, but I wasn't willing to change because I thought, well, I'm, I'm a gay man. I mean, I don't know what else to do. So I, I was 16 and a half and it wouldn't be until I was 20 that I actually gave my life to the Lord. 
But when I was sitting in those drag queen pageants at 19, I knew because I had prayed and I had asked the Lord to come into my heart. I'd asked the Lord to take my life. I'd asked the Lord to show me, to, to change me. And I didn't know how. I didn't have the tools. So I knew to cry out to God because I had been introduced to Him. I had experienced Him in s- some ways, but I had not yet experienced Him in the way to where my heart was ready to change and to where I knew He was my only hope. And so, so I think that I had to come to a crossroads, really, to where I was at the bottom, at, at, at rock bottom, and I had to ask myself the question, what hope do I have? And is there any hope? And that's when I knew to cry out to the Lord. Because I knew that if he could send someone to me to knock on my door when I wanted to end it and I didn't want to live, I knew that, that he was there. I just didn't know that he wanted me. And I wanted to know that he wanted me, that he loved me enough to walk me through this confusion, through this pain, and through, and even through things that I had believed for so long that were lies. They were lies. And I didn't know that they were lies. I thought they were, it was the truth. You know, it was the truth. Well, you're just a homosexual or you're just, you're just, uh, you're just like one of the girls. Don't worry. You're just, you'll just be like one of the girls. And, and I, and I thought, well, no, I, I'm still a man, you know, and, and I have to, I have to embrace that, you know, I have to embrace that. And I started to see so many people in my life, like friends that I had in the world that were in the homosexual lifestyle, that were contracting AIDS, that were dying, that were um, being beat up. Some were being thrown in fields to die. Some did die from hate crimes. Some died. And I remember thinking to myself, what am I doing with my life? And I don't want to die. You know, I don't want to die of AIDS. I don't want to get beat up and die. (laughs) I don't. And uh, not for being a homosexual. No, I just, I, I don't. And so, and so then I remember one day this, I met this guy. I ended up living in a house with a bunch of backslidden Christians because I needed a place to stay. <laughs> and it turns out the house I ended up in was a bunch of backslidden Christians. And uh, one day, one of the guys just wanted to go back to church and he said, hey, come with me. And so I did, I went with him. And I remember praying to the Lord and asking the Lord, Lord, if you don't want me to be a homosexual, if it's so wrong to be a homosexual, then I need you to, t- to show me and I need you to reveal it to me. And so when, when I started going to church, there were all these people and they started to just show me the love of God by inviting me to their houses for dinner, by, you know, talking to me and never, never once did they ever shame me for being in the lifestyle. They did hold their ground when it came to the Word of God and what God had to say about the life I was living. And just sin in general, not just, oh, well, you're in the homosexual lifestyle, but sin in general. You told a lie. <laughs> you're, you're, you're a sinner by nature, you know, capable of all sorts of things. And God wants to be the answer to your life. He wants to be your life. And when I started to see that the people in front of me that were loving me actually had a real relationship with the Lord, that's when I realized this, this was real. God was real. And he had the power to deliver people out of addiction because I had seen it in people that were, that, that were telling me their lives and how God delivered them. And I realized, well, if he can do that for you, I, I want that. You know, and so, and so I started to, 
to really lay hold of the fact that Jesus was my only hope. And he started to show me, you know, that I was worth loving, that I was his and that I belonged to him, that he was there and he saw everything, and that life was more than just me. Life was more than just the life that I was creating, an image that I was creating, and a life that I was trying to live to numb the pain of all the things that had happened in my life. That God actually had a purpose for, for this life I was living, and that it was more than, more than just living it for me, but that I could live it for Him. And be others focused and focus on what he wanted to do in the earth and the fact that he could use me if I would just give him my life and surrender to him and come to the foot of the cross and give him my life. And I remember one night, I remember the day, I even remember the day, <laughs> December 1st, 2002, clear as day. And I just walked in and there was nothing great about the service, nothing great about the teaching. <laughs> and I remember at the end, the guy that was preaching said, if you, of course he did the, the call for um, salvation. And I, I had already prayed and asked the Lord and invited him into my life. So I didn't think I needed that. Of course I did because <laughs> I wasn't living I wasn't really living for God. I wasn't saved. But I thought I was, you know, because I had already prayed. And I was still living crazy lives, still in sin, still at the bars. I was in promiscuous relationships. And I realized that God wanted to come into those areas and deliver me from that. And I realized, okay, I can be free from this. But I thought, okay, well, I've already prayed the prayer, so... I don't really need that. So I, he said, well, if you just want the Lord to come and speak to you and minister to your heart, come to the front. So I did. Did you know that people with sexual problems often have more than one? For example, many sex addicts are sex abuse victims, while many homosexuals also struggle with porn and masturbation. For that very reason, David Kyle Foster has written a book that addresses every major area of sexual sin and brokenness. It's called Sexual Healing, a biblical guide to finding freedom from sexual sin and brokenness. To get the complete picture on freedom from sexual sin and bondage, pick up your copy of Sexual Healing at purepassion.us. Homosexuality and other sexual brokenness problems have become a literal plague in our world today. One resource that brilliantly sums up the essence of what it takes to find freedom is Andy Kamiski's book, Pursuing Sexual Wholeness. Andy is the founder of Desert Stream Ministries and the author of The Living Waters Program. Originally written to address healing for the homosexual, the principles found in this book are central to the healing of any area of sexual or relational brokenness. To get Pursuing Sexual Wholeness, simply go to purepassion.us. And I came to the front and people started praying for me. And I remember there was this man and he prayed for me. It was the father of the minister that had ministered that night. He was a middle-aged guy and he just came up to me and he started ministering to my heart. And he started talking to me about how God saw me and how the father loved me. And it was something so simple like, he loves you. And he just kept saying it. He loves you and he cares about you and you belong to him and I just started to cry and I thought really look at me <laughs> he loves me like don't you know like I'm thinking in my head I'm having this conversation in my head don't you know where I've been don't you know what I've done oh my goodness how could you how could you love me and I remember just feeling the love of God for the first time, experiencing the presence of what I now know to be the Holy Spirit and, and experiencing Him. And I just was like, what is going on here? It was like the Lord had entered me just as this man was speaking to me and I was crying and just belting out a cry. It was like I... 
I had never cried like that in my life. And, and I just remember experiencing the love of God and knowing that something was going on on the inside and that he had finally come into my, into my life. And I remember just saying out loud, okay, I submit. Lord, I submit to you. I submit. And I just falling to my knees. And uh, I even hugged the guy. I, I don't even know if he wanted to hug me, but <laughs> I just hugged him. I just w reached out and I hugged him and, and he hugged me back. And I just cried on his shoulder for about 15 minutes. And I had so many other people praying for me. There was this mother and she was praying for me. And I remember being at the altar worshiping the Lord just because I, I knew that he was speaking to my heart and that he had answered the question, yes, I can deliver you. I can deliver you and show you that you were not, you, you were not made to be a homosexual. You were not made to do all those things that you've been doing. You were not made to be a woman. You were not made to wear a dress. You were not made for that. But it was, it was through his love that I experienced that. It wasn't, you know, someone just hitting me over the head with the Bible and just commanding that I change. It was because I experienced his presence. It was because he, he, he talked to me. <laughs> You know, he actually spoke to my heart through other people. And even as I was in his presence, I realized his love was so real and it was so apparent that I was in sin. It was so apparent to me that I was in sin that I knew that I needed him, that I had need of him and that I didn't have to be shamed of needing him. You know, I remember my father always, always whenever we would come around, it was always like we were a burden to him. He had to send child support. He was always working like crazy as a truck driver. And I always felt so responsible for his agony, for his pain, for the fact that he worked so much because he had to support us. But when I experienced the love of the Father, the way that I did on December 1st, 2002, I'm telling you my life was changed. And I realized that I'm not a burden. I'm not a burden. And that He created me for His glory. God steps on